Alright. Alright. That was cool. How's it going? You guys doing okay? You know, I was here um, for this conference five years ago, and when I started my talk five years ago, I told a story from the circus. I used to work at the circus. I like to think that that inspired them to get this venue here today, kind of moved, moving closer towards the circus. All right, we're not going to talk about the circus today. We're going to talk about something even more interesting than that. We are going to talk about wheat farming, not weed farming, but <laughs> different industry. Wheat farming, and in this case, uh, uh, I like to call the talk Sense and Respond, uh, episode two, The Farm Awakens. And like any good story, uh, it has six acts, okay? So we're gonna go through them pretty quickly. We've got a hero to talk about. We have an empire, right? And ultimately, there's a, some drama, a problem, and an unlikely ally for our hero. Now, to tell this story and make it relevant to this event, there is a framework that I'm going to use and come back to after every act to kind of fill in the blanks. Now, um, if you know, if you're familiar, obviously, with product, modern product development, you're familiar with this concept of the hypothesis statement. Now, the hypothesis statement simply says that we have a problem to solve and that we believe that there is a solution for this problem um, and that meets a user need and that will generate some kind of a business outcome that's good for us as an organization, and ultimately we'll know that we're right when we see some kind of evidence from the market, some kind of uh, a change in the behavior of the people that we're building the product for to tell us that we've built, implemented, and designed something of value that solves a meaningful problem for a real customer in a meaningful way. After every act, I'm gonna come back to this, to this screen right here, and we're gonna start to fill in these blanks. We'll see if we can make one that make, makes a hypothesis statement that actually makes sense. So let's start with this, act one, the user need, or as we like to talk about, the brutal economics of wheat and wheat farming. Now, to get started, we have to meet our hero. Our hero is a humble farmer who lives uh, in a hostile environment, seeking to eke out an existence in that hostile <laughs> environment. Now, it's not this guy, actually, but it's these folks here. This is, these are the farmers, the people who work out in the fields of middle America in this particular case where this video was shot in the middle of the country. But any farmer anywhere um, who is out there trying to build a business to run a family farm, uh, farming wheat. Now, here's the interesting thing about wheat farming. Farmers do not market wheat. There are no advertisements for it. If you drive on the highway across the United States, there aren't any billboards up that say, wheat, it's what's for dinner, right? <laughs> that stuff isn't out there. And even more interestingly, the market does not consider how much it costs to produce the wheat when determining the price, right? The only thing that the market cares about is supply and demand. That's it. How much is there and how much will people pay for it. Now, here's the interesting thing about this, is that at any given moment, any wheat farmer, kind of anywhere in the world, can easily have millions of dollars in seed and labor in the ground itself. And, and that's an investment that is at high risk all the time. It's at risk from wind, from insects, from disease, from fungus, from weather, from UFOs and crop circles, and a variety of weird stuff that kind of pops up and then magically disappears. It's really weird, right? So let's talk. So I know it's mid-afternoon, but we're going to do some math. Really quick. I promise I'll be quick. I'll do all the math for you. Really quick. We're going to talk about the economics of wheat farming. So let's do this real quick. So a bushel of wheat, which is kind of the, the measure, unit of measure for wheat, is about 60 pounds, about 27 kilos is what we're talking about. Now, um, when, we, when we wrote this talk, we focused on a place called uh, Grant County, Oklahoma. That's right here. And uh, in Grant County, Oklahoma, on average, um, a farmer has a yield target about 50 bushels per acre per chunk of land. Uh, the total cost per acre all, all in is about $274 per acre. Okay? Now, total cost is 274. You're getting 50 acres, uh, 50 bushels out of every acre. That means you have to make $5.48 per bushel just to break even. When this talk was written, the market price of wheat was $5.59 a bushel. That means that your margin is 11 cents per bushel. That means that the average farmer in the United States on an average farm size of 438 acres profits $2,409 on one harvest. That's it, right? 
like $409. That's how thin the margins are on wheat farming. Now, I did a lot of research. I'm not a farmer. Uh, I didn't grow up on a farm. Don't know much about farming. Did a lot of research, though, for this talk. And we learned a lot of really interesting expressions from the farmers that we did talk to. So there's this expression that says, farmers say in the United States, they say, rain makes grain. Right? So the, it rains, the wheat grows, and it makes grain. But if it rains too much, or if you don't get the wheat out of the ground in time, you get this thing called wheat with wet feet, uh, which is a, it's a real expression. <laughs> they make that up. Um, and what that means is that fungus starts to grow and starts to kill the crop and starts to ruin it, which means the key here is that timing is everything. In other words, once the wheat is ready to go, you have to get it out of the ground because the risk is huge that the crop will get ruined if you don't harvest it in time. In fact, this is a guy named Steve Pitstick. He's a farmer. He's one of the farmers that we talked to. And when we tried to interview him to understand kind of the, the economics, how this, all this stuff works, he literally said to us, listen, I can't talk right now. It's planting season. Right? Let's talk later. Timing is everything. That's the absolute key here. So we avoid situations where the wheat gets ruined. So let's talk about the user need. Right? Lower costs. I've got to reduce my costs so I can extend my margins. I need to be more efficient in the way that I work, and I have to obey Mother Nature's schedule. Right? That's the user need here. Back to our hypothesis statement. Let's fill in the blank. We believe that we need to meet cost efficiency and timeliness concerns for farmers. Right? Pretty good so far. Act two. The business outcome, or meanwhile at headquarters. This is headquarters. Right? <laughs> It's not headquarters. This is headquarters, right? Headquarters and all these companies looks the same. It's designers and product managers just walking around the halls, right? Uh, building products and services for farmers. And, and specifically, uh, the company that we, uh, we're talking about here is uh, the company's called John Deere. Now, John Deere's been around forever. They've been around for over 100 years. And if you know anything about them, you know that they are the Harley Davidson of farm equipment. People love their John Deere equipment. They call them, we're a deer farm, people will say. We're a deer operation. In fact, uh, people really, 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 really love <laughs> John Deere. Look at the size of some of these. And I will warn you, do not scroll any further down this page. <laughs> it, gets, it just gets worse really, really quickly. Look, I mean, look at, look at that one up there. It's insane. People love, and, and, and rightfully so, right? They, 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 they're big, they're green, they're badass, they're awesome. Like, the, the people will use them for farming. Um, in fact, uh, when I was in Norway late last year, some guy tried to escape the police uh, in his John Deere tractor, which was pretty awesome, right? People love these machines, literally the Harley Davidson of uh, <laughs> um, devices, of, uh, you know, farming machines. And look, and it's not just tractors, right? We think it's tractors, but these guys build amazing technology. It's called precision ag technology. Every single thing you see in this image, John Deere makes. They make the tractor, they make the screens, they make all the sensors, they make all the software, they make all the, the data analysis, all of the recommendations, and the systems are amazing. There's a level of uh, automation, of agency here, like you heard in the last talk from Chris, right, that these machines can take on by themselves to truly increase the efficiency of farming. And they are a hardware company, they're a software company, and they do product discovery. They go and they talk to farmers. They, their primary base of operations is in the American heartland. It's in Iowa. And they go out and they spend time with farmers. Farmers willingly provide feedback to John Deere about how this is working. And to drive this home even more, it's, it's really important to note that these are not cheap machines machines at all. Remember our, our margin. Remember our profit margin, right? These are not cheap machines. There is a build your own tractor wizard on the John Deere website, should you want to build your own tractor. Um, these are the starting prices. In dollars, uh, you will end up easily close to 900000 or a million dollars if you put in all the things that I showed you in that previous photo as well. These are the starting prices for these things. So, uh, John Deere is making these amazingly efficient machines, which means that uh, farmers are doing less work. If farmers are doing less work, we actually don't need as many farmers, so there are fewer farmers. And so the question becomes, what is the business problem that John Deere faces? Well, as I showed you, to generate meaningful profits, you need a big operation, right? In, in wheat farming, you need to uh, the, the big operation. A big operation equals a big expense. Now, the nice thing here is that the technology helps us farm larger areas with less labor, 
Less labor means fewer farmers. Fewer farmers means fewer tractor sales. Right? We're not selling as many machines, so equipment sales are down. So we have to start to rethink our business model. How do we start to use the technology that we're serving to provide additional value and charge for that service as well, not just in selling the actual machines, right? And so we kind of come back to our core business needs. We've got less reliance on equipment sales. We have to d decide, figure out new ways to make money. We've got to protect our margins. We have to stay in business. And most importantly, we've been around 100 years. We cannot lose the loyalty of our customers. The brand is everything here in this particular case, right? So we come back to our hypothesis statement. We believe that meeting cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns, we don't know what set of features just yet, will create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain customer loyalty. Pretty good so far, all right? So act three in our story, the promise, also known as the offer you can't refuse. So this is where we are, right? Uh, we believe that meeting cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns will create less reliance on sales, higher margins, maintain loyalty, right? And we are putting out these sexy, amazing new machines. They're super cool, right? They are, like I said, they're kind of big and green, and they do a bunch of things, and they, uh, th you know, th the efficiency here is unbelievable. In fact, our friend Steve, told us that he can farm 2,500 acres today easier than 500 acres 40 years ago. And here's the amazing things. These things don't just do all of these like, amazing things. They actually do it on their own, right? So what these th with the, uh, the addition of GPS and self-driving technology and sensors, one farmer can actually operate two machines. So one is actually doing the harvesting, the other one's collecting what they're harvesting, going back to the barn, delivering it, coming back. It's absolutely amazing what these things can do and how well it can make you, uh, how successful it can make your farming operation. But there's a catch. There's always a catch, right? In this particular case, there's a license agreement. So you just bought a $900,000 tractor and you own the hardware, but you do not own the software that came with that tractor. You are actively licensing that software for the life of the vehicle to operate the vehicle. So you just spent a, almost a million dollars on a device that you don't actually own and can't actually operate. But it's the software that helps deliver this efficiency, right? And that's the only way to purchase these devices and have them do all those amazing things that we talked about, right? So product features, let's talk about them. Were they more efficient? Obviously, they are more capable. We've got services that come with the tractor at this point. Th we, we provide all of, that, all of that analysis and recommendations. And then ultimately, the license agreement comes along with that as well. So we start to fill out our hypothesis statement. It's looking pretty good, right? We believe that meeting cost, efficiency, and timeliness concerns with greater efficiency, integrated services, and a license agreement will create less reliance on sales, higher margins, and maintain loyalty. How do we know that we are right? Well, let's see what evidence we can find. Act four, in which our hero encounters a problem. Okay, so the wheat is ripe. It's time to harvest. We talked about timeliness. If we don't get it out in time, it goes, uh, it goes bad. We lose our margins. Um, but there's a problem in our field. <laughs> That's not the problem. I hope it's not the problem they have. Right? This problem, the tractor broke, right? Something happened to the tractor. You broke an axle, you popped a tire. Something happened where the tractor cannot operate. You cannot get the harvest out of the field. Now look, if you live near uh, a John Deere dealer, not a big deal. You can get the parts, you can fix it. But most of the folks that uh, we talk to live in places like this in uh, Great Falls, Montana, which is 500 miles from the nearest John Deere dealer. Now, farmers have a DIY, a do-it-yourself culture. They're used to fixing everything on their own. That is part of their culture, self-sufficiency. If it breaks, I'll fix it, and I'll get back on the road and get it together. I do not need to rely on the local dealer to help me fix it. And especially if I live 500 miles away from that dealer, there's no way I can wait for that person to show up to help me fix this. Now, the irony here is that with these new advanced fancy tractors, you cannot fix it yourself. Right? The license agreement that you signed when you bought that tractor 
means that the only way to interact, even physically, with the tractor is to access the software to get a permission to swap out the part, which means you have to go get a John Deere dealer to show up to your place, plug their computer in, authorize the part swap, and then have you do it, right? If you live 500 miles away from a John Deere dealer, that's a problem if you don't get the wheat out in time. How can this be? You just paid close to a million dollars for your tractor. You own the whole thing, right? How come I can't work on my own machine that I just bought? And the answer in the United States is called the DMCA. The DMCA stands for the, the, dig the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it was designed in the late 90s to prevent piracy of DVDs and software that came on CDs. It was illegal for you to break through the encryption to hack the DVD or to hack the software that came on CDs. And that's the legislation that's still in place today, 20 years later. Now, in the last 20 years, software has consumed everything, including all of the devices that we work on and this farm equipment. You're seeing that kind of legislation apply not only to tractors, but to coffee machines with the pods, right, uh, to iPhones, all to cars, to all of these digital systems where the manufacturers retain ownership of the software and license it out to the people who actually buy it. Now, in order for you to modify these modern objects, you need access to the code. You need access to service manuals, to error codes, diagnostic tools. And these organizations like Apple, like Keurig in the past, um, and like John Deere, keep consumers away from these tools. They keep that information out of their hands because that is how they make their revenue, by, uh, by going back to the dealer to, to update the software and help you improve or fix the part. Now, there was a time where if you bought something and you figured out how to get extra value out of it, that value was yours to keep. For example, if you bought uh, a blender and you turned it into a paint mixer, right? You had a new paint mixer. You could do that, right? But today, you are not allowed to modify your devices anymore, even though you paid, in this particular case, almost a million dollars for them. And so the question we have to ask ourselves as we build these integrated hardware and software systems, as we design these experiences, is this, are we solving user needs or are we exploiting user needs? Both of these things will make you money. And so the question is, where do you want to work? What side of this equation do you want to be in? Now, take a, a quick break from our story and we'll come back to it in just a second. How do we know that something works? How do we know that it's a good idea? Right? How do we know that we built something that actually delivered value to a real customer in a meaningful way? Right? Well, the challenge with that is people. People are unpredictable. Culture is unpredictable. There are ways of behavior that we think we can change, but in the end, we can't do that. Or there are uh, behaviors that we think we can predict, and in reality, we are wrong about them. Right? These ideas of people and culture get in the way. We have a problem to solve, and in our head, we design this perfect solution for that problem. It's going to be beautiful, it's going to work, everybody will follow the right direction, we start to increase the fidelity of that solution. It's absolutely going to work exactly like this when we put it out into the wild, right? And then we put it out into the wild, and we see what happens, right? And the culture and the context of use will determine what people will do with our product or service or the thing that we design and put in their hands. Right? We think that we know how to change people's behavior, right? <laughs> they, ne they never crash, by the way, right? It's amazing, it's really amazing, right? We think we know what combination of product, design, feature, value proposition, business model will change people's behavior, but the reality is that our expertise and our experience is often going to be wrong, right? No matter how hard we try to do it, there's always a good chance that we are going to be wrong. And the one thing that we have to take into consideration in all of these cases is that culture, right? Culture is always going to win over the things that we think we can make our customers do, right? The way that we learn quickly about whether or not our ideas work is to get, our, like you've heard all, the, all, all day today, let's get our ideas 
into the hands of users quickly. Let's see how it changes their behavior and let's learn from that and respond and build those feedback loops and those conversations together to make sure that we're meeting those cultural needs, we're meeting those user needs, and we're solving the problems in a meaningful way. All right, so let's get back to this conversation. We believe that meeting this user need with these features will create this business outcome, right? Well, no, we see this evidence. Here's where we are. Right. So cost efficiency, timeliness, and concern, uh, timeliness concerns what the customer cares about. We're going to build these great machines that have integrated services and a license agreement. That's going to uh, reduce our reliance on sales, drive margins up, and maintain our loyalty. How do we know we're right? What's the evidence that we're looking for? Well, Act 5. Our hero finds an, an unlikely ally. So this is our hero. Right? He's out there farming, the wheat is ripe, it needs to be harvested, uh, and the tractor is busted. He needs help. He can't access the tractor to swap out the part because he needs the, authoriz the authorization from the dealer's laptop to, to authorize the software to swap out the part. Who's he going to call? He's going to call <laughs> Billy D. Williams, his friend. No, you know who he's going to call? He's going to call these guys. Ukrainian hackers. Ukrainian hackers have broken all of the John Deere software and hardware and have put it online for American farmers to download and install on their tractors. In fact, if you go on YouTube, you can find videos like this that go on and on and on with these devices that you can buy on the black market, plug into your John Deere tractor, hack the software, right? And that will ultimately allow you to break in and do the things that you actually have to do. These are screenshots from the, from the cracked software. Right? This is what farmers are doing in the Midwest when they run into these situations. Right? Now what's interesting here is that, uh, the thing I want you to remember is everything we do at work is design. I know this whole thing about is everyone a designer? Right? Every decision we make as an organization, not just the pixels, is design. Policy choices, business models are design. And when you enforce bad policy and you build that into your user experience, people will work around that policy. They will find a way to do the things that matter to them the most. They will look for people to help them, they will look for resources, or they will figure it out on their own. Right? Because culture always wins in these situations. How does our story end? Right? This is a really interesting conversation, I think. So this is where we are. This is our hypothesis statement. <laughs> right? <laughs> how, do, how, do we <laughs> how do we know we're right? Right? How do we know we've solved the problem because they're downloading cracked Ukrainian software? Right? That's the evidence that we're seeing. Are we delivering value? Are we solving real problems in a, in a meaningful way? And the response that we're seeing right now, I have to tell you, is not terribly positive. Right? Uh, John Deere is not giving up on this in any way. They are lobbying heavily in the United States government to make sure that organizations move, uh, that, that government organizations don't limit their right to do this and don't increase what's called the right to repair, which is this movement to fix your own things. And uh, it's amazing how many companies are doing this. It's John Deere, it's Apple, it's Microsoft, it's Keurig, um, and they're actively, maybe not so actively, quietly lobbying to kill all of these right to repair bills because it's hurting their business models. These are policy changes that are then being codified in code and in design and in user experience in the world of all the consumers of these companies. And so the question becomes, what happens next? What do we do? Right, there's a thousand of you here, right? What do we do? And the answer is, it's up to you. She's inspirational. Right? It's up to you, right? You have a choice about what to implement. The work that we do is always going to be ahead of the law, right? We're always going to be able to do things that are not necessarily illegal because there's no law governing those things. And there's, there's movement in this particular direction, at least in the United States. Again, this is one of our many, many, many presidential candidates that are <laughs> increasing by the day over here. Uh, and Elizabeth Warren, she is firmly in the camp of driving a national right to repair law, breaking down the inability for farmers to, and anybody else to fix their own devices, right, to provide access to these things. The thing I want you to remember is this. The legal structures that we have in place today 
always going to be behind the technology. Technology moves much faster than the law. It moves much faster than government and legislation. And so that's going to create gaps, gaps where you can do things. You can build business models, experiences, products, services that exploit these gaps. And again, I'm going to ask you the same question as before, slightly different way. Will you use these gaps to serve customers or will you use them to exploit them? Because again, both of these things will make you money. Now, technology will always be ahead of the law, but technology will never get ahead of culture. And the more that we can understand what our customers are trying to do, how they need to work, and, and what elements of their culture are important to them, that define their, their, their work, their lives, their personal existence, right, the better we can build and design products and services for those folks. Because again, if we bake bad policies into our customer experiences, people will work around those policies. It happens all the time. It happens every day. And we're seeing that right now because we don't have that national right to repair law in the United States. There is a movement. And, and believe it or not, and again, uh, politics in the United States are now very, very divided. This is a bipartisan movement. This is every, th there's no side of, of, the, of, the legal, uh, of the political side in the United States that uh, rejects the right to repair movement. We're moving this particular forward. We're seeing things like the right to repair manifesto, right? People are really talking about, hey, look, th not, not only is this good for us uh, financially, but it actually teaches us to be creative, to be self-sufficient, to work on things. There are websites like iFixit, which collect user manuals and error codes and schematics for everything. So it, you're not going to get it from the company. You can go to this website and you can always find it there and put it together and start to build uh, a, you know, a repertoire of repairs for your things. Right? And so the things that I really want you to remember from this talk, the things that take away this, I think is really important, the six things. First and foremost, right, most of you are in the software business, but the only way that you build and scale anything these days, as we saw uh, with the John Deere example, is to build uh, software-based businesses to enhance the services that we deliver to our customers. Now, the amazing thing about being in the software business is that software unlocks new business models. It really does. It allows you to create these new products and services that enhance the physical devices that you create and the, and the value that you deliver to your customers. Policy gets encoded in the software, the code and the design. The, deci the, the business decisions, the cultural decisions of the company get enforced in the software that gets delivered with your products and services. And regardless of that policy, culture will always trump that policy. People will find a way to work around it. If we can build these feedback loops where we can learn what the cultural implications are and what challenges they will raise towards our policy, we can reveal these problems ahead of time and hopefully find a situation where we can meet our business needs and those user needs at the same time. And so ultimately, if we can frame success not in our profit or in our margin, but in user-centric terms, can farmers do what they need to do when they need to do it without delay and without additional cost, right, that makes them successful, that will ultimately make us successful. And at the end, that's what we're here to do. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
So what were the most important key ingredients in a successful Lean AGL project or transformation that you have been involved in? Yeah, the, the most successful ingredients to, to any of these engagements is curiosity and humility. Mm. Honestly, those are the two, like, if, as far as, you know, I don't, not getting the specific process steps, mm. but if you, if, you, if you have an organization, a leadership team, mm. a product development team that's curious, about how to improve what they're building, the products and the services, and they're humble mm. about learning that their ideas were wrong, right? That is where agility comes from. If we, if we kind of forget the process and the religion and all that, we just talk about kind of lowercase a, mm. uh, agile or agility, mm. it comes from humility and continuous learning, right? And so if you're curious about learning the next thing, you learn the next thing, even if it conflicts with your own worldview, yes. you're willing to change course, that's agility, and that, that's, that's how it works. And that has to be top down, not, not yeah. just at the product team. Yeah. Being sensitive to the culture that you're coming into. Absolutely, because you can make assumptions about that culture as well and learn that your assumptions were wrong. And as long as you're willing to accept that you were wrong, yeah. mm. we're on the right path. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Also, uh, many large organizations tend to still focus on the output, as you were talking about, as opposed to the outcome. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about impact and in use as well. It's sort of the same idea. How can we turn that around? So, so look, I mean, I hope that this was a good example of that, right? The output here was this policy, this, this license agreement, and this, this is the only way that you can interact with us. You, that, that's, that's an output, it's the thing that we made. And to be clear, right, uh, output doesn't have to be pixels or bits or code. No. Policy is output, mm. right? Business models are output. The question is, what is the change in the behavior of our customers that we see once mm. we put that into their hands? Right? And I think that what we're seeing here is, is an example of where that output generates a negative outcome, at yes. least for our target audience. And the question becomes, what do we want to do about it as an organization? I think if we can illustrate, if we can shine a light on the behaviors that our output is generating to everybody in the organi organization, especially the decision makers, we stand a chance of, of impacting some of that output mm -hmm. and, and shifting the focus to how well are we actually yeah. making our users or customers more successful. Mm. Well said. Thank you so much, Jeff, for My being pleasure. here today. Thanks very much. Gifts for you will see, receive some, some gifts. gifts for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much.